Thank you, Dr. Mall, and I want to thank Phillips for putting, putting together this uh, symposium. Uh, right off the bat, I want to tell you the previous two talks provide enormous possibilities for use in the Venus system. My talk is going to focus not on all the modern developments that have occurred, but the way it is practiced uh, uh, in the United States, and I suspect uh, in Europe as well at the present uh, time. Now with IVAS, <coughs> IVAS of course was first used for aneurysm and arterial, <coughs> arterial application. And uh, uh, I adapted it for venous use, seeing its potential. <coughs> for a long time it was thought that uh, in post-thrombotic cases, there was a combination of obstruction and reflux. Uh, but, in but in primary cases, non-thrombotic cases was mostly reflux. The use of IVAS completely changed that uh, perspective. We know now that you will find, if you use IVAS, you will find uh, 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 obstruction, an obstructive component in non-thrombotic cases in over 90%. That means both in non-thrombotic as well as thrombotic cases, there's going to be an element of obstruction that can be corrected with stent technology. Even more surprising, I used to do open valve reconstruction. So uh, I was still doing open valve reconstruction when stent technology came along. And my idea was, boy, I can, I can do a complete correction. Since most CVD pathology is combination of obstruction and reflux, I can correct obstruction with, with a stent and then correct the reflux later with a more difficult valve reconstruction procedure. So initial set of patients underwent uh, stent placement. Funny thing happened in follow-up. The clinical improvement after correcting the obstruction alone was so good that most patients uh, did not want anything further. Uh, clinical improvement was substantial. So 528 limbs, obstruction was stented. Majority had severe reflux. Clinical relief from initial stenting was unexpectedly good and correction of the remaining reflux was not uh, necessary. This means stenting alone is curative in 60 to 70 percent of limbs despite uncorrected residual reflux. If you correct the obstruction, the presence of reflux does not seem to matter. The implication of this is stent technology is going to be usable in the vast majority of patients with chronic venous disease. Many of them will have reflux. Most of them will have obstruction. You can ignore the reflux and do the stent procedure and you will get substantial clinical relief. Now venography is still used uh, in stent placement. That's because uh, Interventional radiologists were among the first to use uh, stent placement for iliac vein stenosis, and in many places, despite IVAS, uh, venogram, venography is the standard. Now, this is a rotational venogram, and you can see on the left side there is a, there is a lesion right here, but as you rotate, the lesion goes away. On the other hand, there is no lesion here on the frontal projection, but as you rotate, the lesion comes into view. Iliac uh, cable lesions are unique that they are 2D. Most of them are 2D because they are under arterial crossover points. So frontal projection, you don't see anything, but you rotate, you have a tight uh, stenosis. Not only that, if you're going to do stent, you have to identify the iliac cable confluence, right? So in this venogram, 
where is the confluence? Is it, where is the, is it, uh, is it here, maybe here, or maybe here? Uh, where is the, uh, where is the confluence? So you need to know where the iliac IVC junction is to do proper uh, stenting. So we took a uh, bunch of cases, 162. These have already been stented with IVIS uh, findings recorded. And we gave it to our uh, local uh, radiologists, and we asked them to tell us, in their view, looking at the venogram, where is the iliac IVC confluence? Can you see a stenosis? If they can see a stenosis, where is the, where is the stenosis? Is it in CIV, EIV, or CFV? And then, what percentage of stenosis did they think it was? We asked them what was the optimal proximal landing zone based on the venogram, and what was the optimal distal landing zone. So proximal landing zone, with IVUS, of course, you can see the IVUS catheter there, and you localize it according to the upper, mid, or lower of L3, L4, or L5, and the radiologists were asked to do the same thing. Now, the radiologists were also asked to tell us where was the stenosis. In this particular picture, you can't see any stenosis, right? In some venograms, you can't see stenosis, but on IVUS, of course, you can, you can see where the stenosis is, and you can actually measure the stenosis by planimetry. We asked them to tell us what, they, what would be the ideal landing zone if they found a stenosis and if they plan to correct it based on the venogram and related to various bony landmarks. So the results was venography was unable to identify lesion existence in 25% of venograms. You can't see the lesion in 25% of venograms. When stenosis was identified on venography, the location of maximum disease, CIV, EIV, or CFV, was correct in only 33% of venograms. The maximum degree of stenosis varied significantly with, uh, between the venogram and IVUS. With uh, venogram, the mean, uh, uh, the difference was nearly 30%. IVUS, the stenosis was much more severe compared to estimated uh, stenosis on venogram. Uh, average degree of stenosis by venogram was 32%, but on IVUS it was 50%. Uh, so with this means on venogram you tend to underestimate the degree of uh, stenosis. So the conclusion was the location of the iliocable bifurcation varies substantially. You would think anatomy is fixed, right? The anatomy book, it says, iliac IVC confluence is at L5. It ain't so. In post-thrombotic cases, the veins, because of fibrosis, they foreshorten, and the bifurcation gets pulled up. Every once in a while, you will see the IVC bifurcation at L2 in post-thrombotic cases, not at L5. On an average, the difference of IVC confluence based on venogram compared to IVUS was one full vertebral body, which means there's going to be an error when you stent based on a venogram. Relying on venography may result in missing the lesion or jailing the contralateral Iliac vein. The anatomical characteristics of venous lesions, including degree and location of maximal stenosis, were not accurately identified with venography. Venogram missed or was inaccurate in determination of adequate landing zone in 71% and missed distal disease in up to 52%. In American colloquial terms, this means Venogram sucks. You can't use it for stenting. This is an important, uh, Marjolaine is going to talk about perfusion. This is an important concept that is central to venous stenting. 
in arterial stenting, you are concerned about perfusion. You want to increase the perfusion pressure in the periphery. For chronic venous disease, the aim is to reduce peripheral venous pressure because venous hypertension is the basis of chronic venous disease. So in arterial stenting, as long as you can establish straight inline flow, that's fine. And you tend to under, under stent a little bit because you don't want to blow up the artery. You know, they say perfect is the enemy of uh, good. So you stop without, on the venous side, you have to restore what is an optimal value for the vein because you want to reduce the pressure. Under stenting in venous applications will result in residual symptoms. So you have to you have to use big stents and big balloons and these are the reference values you should use. Two hundred square millimeter. There is hemodynamic reasons for this. I would go into it. Two hundred square millimeters for CIV, one fifty for EIV, one twenty five for CFV. And you can't do it on venography, right? Because venography has no scale. The only way to apply these reference values during stenting is to use IVUS, which is a which is which is a big big reason to use IVUS during venous stenting. IVUS preliminary stenosis percentage stenosis should be calculated on above values, not related to adjacent normal segment, as it. You know, the arterial carotid stenosis, for example, you look at the stenosis on duplex, you see what is adjacent normal segment and calculate the percentage of stenosis. In veins, you can't do it for this reason. You look at the venogram, it looks normal, right? But on IVUS, you have a very tight stenosis with uh, actually you can see some trabeculae Trabaculae right over there. That's 72 square millimeters. Normal should be 200. So you're really looking at somewhere around 70% uh, stenosis. Now, one other lesion common to veins that is not present in arterial applications is long diffuse stenosis. Now, this is a long diffuse stenosis. How do you know? Look at the femoral vein. Iliac vein is half the size of femoral vein, so you know it's, it's, it's stenotic, except on venography you don't have a scale, so you don't appreciate that it is stenotic. This is known as Rokitansky stenosis, and it's present in about 20% of cases with or without additional focal stenosis. Same case, it's 97 square millimeters, or 50% stenosis on IVUS uh, planimetry. Now, IVUS is not perfect. Current systems do, are, not, uh, uh, are, are not supported by uh, not coaxial, and the tip can tilt at the end. And this becomes a problem at confluence. If the, if the tip uh, uh, tilts here, you will see part of the lesion the other, you miss the other side of the lesion, and then this, uh, this thing gets blurry as the, as the uh, as, uh, sonographic uh, rays diverge, so to speak. So <coughs> this, is, uh, this will result in an appearance, something like this. You can see part of the lesion here. You miss the other part, and all you see is a blurry, missing border appearance. This happens in about 15% of cases. And uh, what you do is, after you do the IVUS, you do a balloon sizing like here, and you can pick up lesions that you might have missed on IVUS. Thank you.